God is good. And he's more than enough. Amen. We're continuing in our studies in the book of Acts. Um, and the title of today's message, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 25, verses 1 through 27. The title of today's message is Trials and Error. So we're continuing to look at Paul's various legal trials and testimonies on his journey to Rome. Have you ever had to testify in court? I have. I went to trial for a traffic ticket. Pleaded not guilty. I wasn't guilty. I wanted to maintain my claim of innocence and have space to testify. I wanted it on record. I'm not guilty and I'm going to tell my side of the story. Resort of the trial, I ended up having to pay court costs, which ended up being more than the ticket costs. <laughs> but it wasn't about the money. It was an issue of integrity, right? See, Paul could have bought his way out of prison, right? Remember, uh, uh, Felix was hanging on, hoping that Paul would give him some money. He could have bought his way out. But the Lord wanted Paul to testify about Christ. Paul was destined to stand before Caesar's judgment seat to testify about Christ. And so what we're seeing um, over these last uh, several weeks is that God orchestrated a situation in which Paul would testify to multiple high-level government officials as he worked his way to Caesar. So just by way of background for those who may have not uh, heard the last few messages. Paul was arrested at the temple in Jerusalem on false charges. He's rescued by Roman soldiers and then he uses his Roman citizenship to avoid being scourged. Then a plot is revealed against Paul's life. and He's taken to the Roman governor's palace, uh, the Roman governor Felix, uh, then he's on trial before uh, this Roman governor, Felix. The prosecutor is unable to prove his case against Paul. And the religious accusations that they bring against him fall outside of the scope of Roman law at the time. And so Felix keeps Paul in prison for two years to gain political favor with the Jewish people and to try to extort Paul for money. Section one. Next slide. Corrupt shepherds who abuse their power will give an account to the great shepherd on the day of judgment. I call your attention to Acts chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> now when Festus had come to the province after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. So Festus replaced Felix as the governor of Judea. He meets with the high priest and the Sanhedrin, which was that group of elders that kind of made up the Supreme Court in, this, in the sense and they try to get Festus to support their plot to murder Paul. 
Now I have I have to lay there for a minute. We got we gotta we gotta deal with this for a minute. Park here for a minute. So the question on the table is how did the high priest, right? <laughs> how did the high priest and the elders become so corrupt? Next slide. Letter A on your handout. See, the high priest was anointed to be a spiritual leader in the nation of Israel. We see that all the way back in Exodus chapter 28, 1 through 4, where Aaron and his sons were anointed and appointed to be the high priest of Israel. The high priest was the top ranking priest and leader of the Levitical priesthood, overseeing all matters related to ceremonial practices. The high priest represented the people to God, and he represented God to the people. The high priest was the only person authorized to go behind the veil in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement once per year. The high priest held spiritual and temporal authority. The priest also served as judges and teachers of the law. Next slide. And so the, the elders of Israel was uh, uh, started out as a group of around 70 men that date back to the time of Moses. And they were appointed by God to help judge the people. You are familiar with the story. Moses is judging all the people by himself. His father-in-law gives some wise advice and says you need some help. And so God uh, tells Moses to appoint uh, these elders to help him judge the people. But during OT history, if you read, read the, the Old Testament, uh, you see that during Old Testament history, the leaders of Israel became complicit in turning the nation away from God to idols. And this eventually led to their captivity by foreign nations. Then during that 400 year period in between uh, the, the end of the Old Testament, if you will, and the beginning of the, the New Testament, we call that the intertestamental period. So the Old Testament ends with the people returning to their land after the Babylonian captivity. And we see leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah helping to get the people back in alignment with God's word. But during the intertestamental period, uh, they come, they're, they're still under uh, foreign rule and the Greek empire rises up and takes over and there's a, a wicked king who tries to destroy the priesthood and desecrates the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. And so there's this successful Jewish revolt that briefly restores Jewish independence and created the Hasmonean dynasty, which uh, was a, a Jewish, uh, a dynasty of Jewish rulers that lasted somewhere around 100, 150 years or so until the rise of the Roman Empire. So during this time of this brief period of Jewish independence in between the Old and the New Testament, we see this group, the Sadducees, whose name means the righteous ones, develop as a priestly aristocracy that controlled the temple and compromised with Roman politics. By the time of Christ, the temple had become a cash cow. See, Matthew 21, 13, he said, my father's house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. It's making money hand over fist off the people. And as we can see, the leaders function more like gangsters than man of God. <laughs> talking to Festus like this, this Paul character, he's uh, causing a lot of trouble all over the empire. We got to do something about this guy. But don't worry about it, Festus. We'll take care of him. You just have him sent down to Jerusalem for trial, and we got some guys that's, that's going to handle him. Just messing with their pockets. Jesus came in there tearing up the temple to kick the money changers out. They're like, oh, this guy got to go. He got to go. 
can't serve God and mammon. Ananias, you know he was a gangster. That's the one that had Paul slapped in the mouth. Right. <laughs> and he insulted him. So Ananias, the current high priest, was appointed by King Herod Agrippa II. That's a problem right there because the high priest was appointed by God, not by Gentile anyways. That's a whole other lesson. But this goes to show the level of corruption and how this position became political uh, more than spiritual. But historians report that Ananias was actually assassinated by zealots in AD 66. See, eventually the zealots uh, they, they did take over Jerusalem over a while, for a while. Yeah, and they got rid of Ananias. They got rid of everybody who was a compromiser uh, to Rome. And then the Romans actually ended up coming in and they destroyed the temple and, and uh, destroyed the city just like Jesus had predicted. But um, Ananias actually got assassinated by the zealots uh, eventually. Came to a bad end. And then we see the Sadducees disappear from history after the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. You don't hear about Sadducees no more. Because they were all so tied to the temple, um, they faded from history. Next slide. So that begs the question, how should a godly leader function? Uh, I think we can see a glimpse out of Esther chapter 3 verse 10 when we look at Mordecai. It says, for Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren. And this is the key. He was seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen, right? That's what leaders should do. Seek the good of their people and speak peace, right? See, God appoints governing authorities and we are subject to them because, because they have delegated authority from God. We see that in Romans 13, 1 through 2. Leaders who abuse their authority will be held accountable by God. Draw your attention to Ezekiel's word to the false shepherds. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. Ezekiel 34, 7 through 10. And then listen to what the Lord Jesus says. Matthew 24, 45 through 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God is not playing with wicked leaders. But thanks be to God for not leaving us at the mercy of sinful human high priests. We have the Lord Jesus our great high priest. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 7 says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath, which came after a law, appoints the son 
who has been perfected forever. Amen. Hebrews 7, 26 through 28. And so Festus deflects the request of the corrupt leaders and maintains that the trial will take place in Caesarea. Next slide, please. Section 2. You can stand confidently before the judgment seat after you visit the mercy seat. Let's look at verses 26, I'm sorry, verses 6 through 7. And when he had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. The accusers, next slide, the accusers could not prove their case before Felix or Festus. We're in section A, uh, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, section A under section 2, uh, letter A on the handout. So they couldn't prove their case before Felix, they couldn't prove their case before Festus, and they couldn't prove their case because the incident never happened. Right? They tried to accuse Paul of bringing a Gentile into the temple, he didn't do that. It was false, so of course they couldn't prove it because it never happened. And see, the law of God, of God, God's law, upholds the principle of fair trials. Right? Deuteronomy 19.15 talks about you need at least two witnesses. The Lord Jesus and Paul both applied this principle to the church. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Right? Uh... Paul and, and Timothy says, don't bring a charge against an elder without two or three witnesses. Don't just be bringing charges against people. No witnesses. So may we not be guilty of injustice in the church by neglecting the biblical conflict resolution process. Amen. May we not be guilty of false, well definitely not false accusations, or skipping God's process. I just want to read this. 1 Timothy 5.19. He says. Um, Do not receive an accusation against an elder. Except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all. That the rest also may fear. So God has a process. For dealing with sin. Among leadership and in the church. Amen. Next slide. Verse 8. So they lay these uh, complaints against Paul. Which they couldn't prove. Uh, verse 8. While he answered for himself. So Paul answers for himself. Neither against the law of the Jews. Nor against the temple. Nor against Caesar. Have I offended in anything at all. See, Paul mentions three layers of accountability. The law of the Jews, the temple, and Caesar, which represents Roman law. See, Paul didn't just use the gospel as an excuse to live as a renegade, disregarding and disrespecting the cultural context he ministered in. See, Paul exercised his freedom in Christ in an unselfish way so that he can be an effective ambassador for Christ. And listen to his own words. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be, that I may be partaker of it with you. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 22, 23. This was Paul's lifestyle for the sake of the gospel. May we seek 
the leading of the Holy Spirit on how to exercise, how to exercise our freedoms, how to exercise our rights in a way that bear the most fruit for the kingdom of God. Amen. We thank God that we have rights. Amen. We know we got rights, but let us exercise those rights as we're led by the Spirit of God. Amen. We have to choose our battles. That's going to bring God the most glory. Amen. Next slide. Verses 9 through 12. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. Festus, the secular politician, tested the waters to see if Paul would agree to travel to Jerusalem for another trial. But there was no legal precedent for this. It was an attempt to do a favor for the corrupt leaders. And so we see another example of Paul exercising his rights in a godly way. As a Roman citizen, Caesar's judgment seat was the highest court in the empire. See, the Roman Empire had absorbed a multitude of nations and ethnic groups. The Jews were able to maintain uh, their practice and their observance of the law of Moses, which was obligatory, obligatory for the Jewish people uh, because of their culture and the covenant that that people had with God. And Paul chose to maintain a clear conscience before God and men by honoring both spiritual and temporal obligations. He chose to live as a person of integrity. Now the very people who were accusing Paul, they were the ones of violating God's law and Roman law. See, Roman law was based on what was called the 12 tables. And they were basically general guidelines uh, that the magistrates were supposed to use to kind of help them discern how to judge a case. Now, even under Roman law, the pagan Roman Empire, it was illegal to execute a person who was not convicted of a crime. These was idolaters, pagans, and even they had that in their law. And it was illegal to bribe a judge. And what did Felix do? Hail Paul, hoping he would give him some money. They was guilty. They should have been on trial. And these activities was also illegal under the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 16, 18, 18 through 20. So on the one hand, Paul had the right to appeal to Caesar as a Roman citizen, seeing that his case was not settled at the lower court. But on the other hand, it was God's plan for Paul to testify in Rome. Right? Acts 23, 11. It says, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. It was God's plan. So now I got to give you all a little history before we move on to the last section. Paul appeals to Caesar. Who was this Caesar that Paul appealed to? None other than Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, <laughs> a.k.a. one of the most wicked men to ever walk the earth. Yeah, Who was Nero? Nero's mother poisoned her husband mm. so Nero could become emperor at 17. Mm. Then she taught him to poison people. <laughs> so what does Nero do? He kills his rival to the throne, his own Little brother. Now, granted, he was 17. 
So his brother was still a child at the time. Poisoned little boy, dropped dead on the spot. History tells us that he married two men. One man acted as his husband, a man named Pythagoras. And during this wedding, Nero dressed like a woman because he was the wife and Pythagoras was the husband. Then Suetonius, another historian, writes that Nero's final marriage was to a young man named Sporus, who Nero had this young man castrated and dressed like a woman to marry him. Nero was also a rapist. He raped a Vestal Virgin. Vestal Virgins were female priestesses who took a vow of chastity. That crime itself was punishable by death in the Roman Empire. He's infamous for blaming a fire. A bad fire broke out in Rome. They didn't have fire departments and stuff like we have today. And so um, the section of town where the Christian community was didn't burn up. And so the people were blaming Nero, and to get the heat off of his back, he, start, he blamed it on the Christians, started a rumor that the Christians set the fire. So he blames this fire on the Christians and spearheaded the first official persecution of Christians by the Roman Empire. Some of the atrocities committed. He burned Christians as torches to light his garden. Tradition says he had Paul beheaded. Tradition says he had Peter crucified. He was known for sending Christians to the arena to die by wild beasts. Eventually, the people turned on Nero, and he ended up committing suicide at age 30 by stabbing himself in the throat. And what makes this so sad is that Nero had the opportunity to accept Christ as Lord, and he rejected the Savior. Now, I don't want to spend eternity where somebody like that is. Next slide, section three. The resurrection of Christ Jesus is a historical event that was discussed in the secular Roman court. Verses 13 through 22. After some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me. When I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him, to them I answered, It is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would also like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So who is Agrippa? Uh, Agrippa's Herod Agrippa II, the last member of the Herodian dynasty. So within 10 years of these events we're reading about, God brought an end to the temple, the priesthood, and the Herodian dynasty. So when you hear Herod or Agrippa, um, just a little uh, quick backstory. So Herod the Great, that's the, uh, the first Herod uh, of the dynasty. He was the one who tried to kill the baby Jesus, who the wise man visited, right? Herod Antipas, that was the Herod who had John the Baptist's head cut off, the one who Jesus stood uh, before on trial. Herod Agrippa I, that was the Herod that had James the Apostle killed and had Peter in prison. And then Herod Agrippa II, we're seeing him, the last Herod. 
Each one of these Herods had a chance to turn to God and did. Next slide. So Festus recounts Paul's case to Herod and admits Paul was not accused of breaking any Roman laws. Christianity was not illegal or considered a threat at this time. So Festus understood that the conflict was related to Paul's testimony about the resurrection of Christ. Now here we have a pagan governor discussing the resurrection of Christ to another secular ruler in the context of a legal case. Unlike Paul, I didn't use my time in court trial as an opportunity to proclaim the resurrection, but Paul did. And so the question for us is, do you affirm that Jesus is alive? This is what Paul was testifying in his trials. Do you affirm that Jesus is alive? Do you affirm that Jesus died for our sin, was buried, and rose on the third day? Next slide. As we're preparing to close. So the next day, verse 23. When Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him, Therefore, I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. Festus, the master politician, appointed by Nero, again admits that there are no former charges, formal charges against Paul. But Paul understood that even though he was in prison without just cause, his mission was to proclaim the gospel to whoever he was placed in front of. Paul's life and testimony was not based on the latest religious fad or man-made philosophy. He was testifying of real events that had happened within the last 20 or 30 years of his trial. Think of September 11th event that happened about over 20 years ago. An event that happened over 20 years ago, but people in our country still remember that. Those who are alive. Jesus was executed by a Roman governor and arrested by the Sanhedrin. That was a legal documented event. Jesus suffered scourging and crucifixion, which was capital punishment of the Roman Empire. Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man who begged the Roman governor for Jesus' body so he could bury him. This is political, legal activities. The Roman governor authorized guards to secure the tomb Jesus' body was placed in legal political actions. The Roman guards testified that Jesus' body was missing from the tomb and were paid by the Jewish leaders to spread a lie. Next slide. Do you believe the truth? Jesus died for our sin. He rose on the third day. He is seated at the right hand of God until it is time for him to return to judge the world. Do you believe the truth? Or do you believe the lie that you can do whatever you want in this life with no eternal consequences? There is only one way to God. Don't believe the lie. There are not many roads to God. 
There is only one way to God. Jesus Christ. Believe on him. And you will receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Amen.